Greetings, brethren. One, wonderful to see all of you this Sabbath. It's actually a pretty lovely day, even though it's a little chilly, but uh, very nice to see the sun out. Uh, it's a significant week ahead, and I'm not talking about changing daylight savings time, which is coming this weekend. Um, I'm not talking about St. Patrick's Day, uh, but I'm talking about actually something that comes at the same time, uh, which is the Feast of Purim. Uh, the Feast of Purim is Wednesday night and Thursday, and that is one month before the Passover. Now, these are tied together, as we will see more about. When we look at God's holy days through the year, as laying out His plan, you know we have the three seasons in the year. We have in the early spring, uh, Passover, the Days of Unleavened Bread, which the Jews call the season of our redemption. We have the late spring, Pentecost, uh, which the Jews call the season of the giving of our law. I believe that's when the Ten Commandments were given, certainly right about then. Uh, then they have, of course, the, the final season, the season of our rejoicing, which is uh, late summer to early fall, the time of uh, trumpets and the Feast of Tabernacles in the eighth day. But we also have these big gaps in the year. You have a long summer. And maybe we might think of that as the time of waiting for the kingdom, you know, from the, the spring holy days until we get to the fall holy days, we're, we're waiting. But we also have an even longer gap uh, in the late fall and winter. Uh, we're waiting, you know, from the end of the eighth day till we get to the Passover. And uh, that, that is a kind of a lengthy period. Maybe we think of it as starting over or even waiting to begin <laughs> in a way. We think about it in those terms, but it's a, a fairly sizable gap. It's interesting that um, the Jews actually fill in these gaps with some other uh, occasions that they observe. In the summer, uh, they have these significant fast days like Tishba Av and you know, rem remembering some negative events, but l looking ahead to God. And of course, we can see some value in that, that gap of time of repenting and uh, fasting and looking forward to the kingdom. We, we need to do that as we go. And then also uh, in the winter time, there are two festivals that the Jews observe. They observe uh, Hanukkah and they observe Puri, uh, both of these festivals in between. Now, these are biblical festivals. That is, they are in the Bible. Uh, Purim is, of course, in the book of Esther. Hanukkah is in the New Testament. It's in the book of John. Uh, it is also previewed in the book of Daniel, where it talks about the events that it would be commemorating. Uh, these, of course, have been corrupted by the Jewish people over time, and that's sad. We think about how these days were actually meant to keep the Jews distinguished from the world, and in some ways they've gone into worldly observance. Kind of no coincidence that, it, that we're this day today, you know, will be right around the time of St. Patrick's because there's some pagan things that have been brought in even to the Jewish observance of, of these festivals, and that's sad. But they are uh, instituted, they were, you know, instituted for good reasons in the Bible. They're not commanded in the law. They're not part of what we are, you know, commanded to observe for the year, but we should take note of them and study them as meet in due season, you know, when they come around because they are significant to us. And um, I want to ask the, uh, the question, you know, how do these festivals fit within God's festival plan? Specifically, how does Purim fit within God's festival plan? Because as it turns out, I believe these festivals actually do fit within the Holy Day plan, as we will cover. Uh, and I've titled this Purim Prelude and culmination of God's plan. Prelude and culmination, prelude to, if you will, and culmination of God's plan. And how is that? Number one, it made the fulfillment of the plan possible. It made the fulfillment of the plan possible. I mean, you think about, when we start thinking about these festivals and what, how they were fulfilled, they started being fulfilled with the Passover, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ there among the Jewish people and, and all that happened then and continuing on, well, none of that would have happened if the events of Purim would not have happened. If God had not delivered the Jewish people from being obliterated and not allowing 
that we, you know, they would not have been able to return to set up a Jewish state in the Holy Land. You wouldn't have had any of that. It was, it was all prelude in that sense, if you think about it. It was an ongoing deliverance that God had before of his people that allowed even the beginning steps of God's plan of salvation to occur. So that's quite significant. I could say the same about you know, Hanukkah in that sense. It, it was needed for those events to happen, to be able to have the, uh, the salvation events that, that happen in the New Testament and going on from there. So it is clearly a prelude. Uh, without it, there would be no, uh, no Jews, no Christianity. There would, uh, we would not be here observing what we do, and we would certainly not be on our way to ultimate salvation in the kingdom. So that's, that's one way uh, that it, it made the fulfillment of the plan possible. Number two is about the timing during the year. I'd like you to turn over the book of Esther, Esther 3, to start here and note a few things. Esther 3. Uh, we'll look at verses 5 through 7. This is where you know Haman got very upset when he saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay him homage. Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. In the first month, says in verse 7, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast poor, that is the lot, before Haman to determine the day of the month until it fell on the twelfth day, which is the month Adar which is the last month, the, the 12th month. Now, actually this year, uh, Purim falls in the 13th month, and the reason for that is because every, you have to add a 13th month to the calendar every once in a while, and when they do that, they consider the 13th month as not only a second 12th month, it, they, it's the dominant 12th month <laughs> is the way it's looked at. So that it's, it's sort of like repeating the month, but it's repeating it to where it's the the actual month. And that way they also make sure that Purim is always 30 days before Passover, which I think is, is probably fitting. Uh, but anyway, looking at this, this is when Haman landed on. It was nearly a year later. Uh, it was 11 months later at that time. So it's interesting because um, if we continue on here, we see exactly when this was uh, in uh, verses 12 through 17. Then the king's scribes were called on the 13th day of the first month. That is the day before the Passover. Passover would be that night. Uh, and a decree was written according to all that Haman commanded to the kings, satraps, the governors who were over each province, to the officials of the people, uh, to every province according to script, and every people in their language, in the name of King Ahasuerus, who was written and sealed with the king's ring. So they're going to kill all the Jews, is what it's saying, when you get to this time of the of Adar on the 13th, you know, of Adar, but this was sent out on the 13th day of the first month. So a copy was issued and, and it was posted in the city. And when Mordecai, who, you know, was an official then at the, at the palace, it says, when Mordecai learned, verse, chapter 4, verse 1, all that happened, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out in the midst of the city. And he cried with a bitter cry, and he was going there before the gate. And uh, then it says that, you know, he was wanting Esther to find out about this, and, you know, her maids came out. Well, you know, they were trying to figure out what's wrong here, and uh, they started sending these messages back and forth. Well, I think, with the timing of this, it makes sense to me that this was running into that night, which would be the Passover, is when this happened. Uh, and it, so that it says, uh, you know, and it's very interesting, too, if we get to verse 11, because Esther says, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. That's also very interesting. So for the past 30 days before this, this is the time of Passover is when she's talking about right now, but for the 30 days before, which would go back to when Purim ends up being, even though it didn't exist yet, <laughs> it was 30 days before, is when, is that whole time, she was cut off from the king. I find that very interesting. That month-long period is actually accounted for, the, the period before from Purim up until Passover is, is accounted for right there. But then, 
Uh, Mordecai told, you know, was told Esther's words in verse 13. Mordecai told them to answer, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows? whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. That's why she's there. And uh, verse 15, Then Esther told him to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan, and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So, and Mordecai you know, went and did that. So it looks to me, with the timing of this, like it's right at Passover, when Esther makes this commitment to possibly die, you know, she's offering herself as a sacrifice to go before the king to save her people. And she could well be dead. And there's going to be this period of three days, night and day of fasting, which to me seems like the very beginning of the Days of Unleavened Bread, which would be the exact same time that Jesus was in the grave for three days and three nights that it may be exactly the same. Now, I don't want to say it's exactly the same. It doesn't specify it exactly. I think it probably is, but it's very close. <laughs> so there's surely significance in this. It's not a coincidence, is what I'm saying. There's no way this is a coincidence that about this very exact same time, uh, you've got these three days and three nights of fasting. And then, you know, that, that's just stunning to me. So we have this... Uh, this amazing parallel where she was basically committed to sacrifice for these three days and then at the end of three days she went in before the king he extended the golden scepter and she was raised up kind of like freed from death she was raised out of death in other words on that third day it says on the third day she went to the king is what it says it's it's very powerful if you think about that uh, later it actually spe specifies that you know that it's on the third day. So these are clues to the plan of salvation that will come later, but it's already being acted out in these events that happen here. And of course, then you had these two banquets that followed, which would be at the end of the Days of Unleavened Bread, ending with the vanquishing of the enemy, kind of parallel to when Pharaoh's army was destroyed in the sea at the end of the Days of Unleavened Bread. Uh, Jericho was destroyed at the, the end of the days of unleavened bread. There's many parallels through scriptures for all these things. We see these amazing parallels, but, but is not exactly the same. It's not exactly the same. One thing is God's name is not even mentioned in Esther. He is hidden. That name Esther means hidden in one sense, but he is clearly there. I'm going to read something to you to kind of make this point that was sent to me. It was from uh, Jesus' boat in the Galilee. Uh, dated March 7th, 2022, two, called Purim, Passover, and Miracles. Uh, and it says, is it from Purim to Passover or Passover to Purim? I'm going to skip into this. And I think this is just a br brilliant, actually, when I thought about it. It says, no matter how confusing it seems, you know, about the, the dating of these things, it says there's a reason why Passover is the first holiday and Purim is the last holiday. And it is indeed profound and all about the miracles of God. Passover marks the beginning of the Judaic faith becoming the Jewish people. They left Egypt and threw off the bonds of slavery. They were able to flee in the midst of the most incredible miracles from God. It began with the burning bush that wasn't consumed. Then there were the ten plagues which commenced turning the Nile into blood and culminating in the killing of the firstborn. Moses parted the Red Sea. Manna fell from the sky. Each and every person witnessed these stupendous miracles. It solidified to them that they were indeed the chosen people. The miracles of the Exodus were God controlling the forces of nature as only he can. They were showing the Jewish people that he is the God of gods, the one true God, the King of kings. These miracles were vital. So the Jewish nation's faith would ultimately become unshakable and unyielding. Now at Purim, the final holiday in the 12th month of the year, there was also a miracle. Yet, there were no flashes from the sky, no upheavals, no suspension of the laws of nature. It was subtle, and to some, not even recognizable as a miracle. Nevertheless, at every step, there is God's providence for the salvation of his people. The miracle was that all Jews, young and old, were to be annihilated by the wicked Haman. Haman was thwarted 
frustrated and defeated by God's infinite mercy working through Esther and Mordecai and even through the king. The Jewish people were spared and God's hand was upon it. So we have to wonder, if God is capable of all he did for the Exodus, why work so subtly? Why didn't God just strike down Haman with a lightning bolt? The answer is simple. God does not need the grand demonstration to show us that he unquestionably rules the world. And so in the case of Esther, and in reality in most cases, the laws and rules of nature are not upended. Nature remains nature, maintaining all its inherent properties. Logically, what was set to happen should have, but then it did not. Why? God willed it. Thus, the final holiday of the year is God showing us his faithful that he works through us. We are not to wait for parting waters and burning bushes to do his will. He reveals himself through our everyday experiences. Hence, as tradition dictates, we celebrate Purim first on the Jewish calendar as we do. So let us remember that he reveals himself through the good works of his believers, through our own decisions and actions, through his word. He is the guiding hand. If our spiritual eyesight is perceptive, we will see and understand these revelations pointing us to God as we move towards the season of freedom at Passover. So that's it, brethren. God works, you know, not only in these external miracles, but guiding people's lives from within, leading them to the ultimate victory, the enemy's vanquished. And that's number three, that it sets up the spiritual fulfillment of God's, pass of God's festivals. Purim sets up the spiritual fulfillment of God's festival because he's working within people to bring about this end. In the end, beyond everything, is the defeat of sin and death with God and his people enduring and his light and glory shining out through them. Purim looks forward to this ultimate future. As I said, it gives a prelude and culmination and the means to get from one end to the other. The whole plan. Yes, Purim, brethren, a biblical festival, something to think about this week.